Okay, we're live and I'm gonna let people in. So, okay, good luck. here we go. Dan, I'll click slides. Perfect. Hi, good morning and welcome everybody. Looks like we have some folks still connecting in. So we're gonna give it just a moment here, but welcome. We're so glad you could join us. If you wanna go ahead and start us off by getting your name and um, where you work, so your organization in the, in the chat room there, that would be really helpful. Um, just a good way to kind of connect, see who's here uh, and locate that chat box because that is how we will take questions today. So we're gonna hold for just another moment, give people a chance to connect in and then we'll get rolling. All right, hello and good morning. It looks like almost everybody's got their connection going. We've got a few still working on it. Um, but let's go ahead and run through our reminders and our welcome. So I'm Emily with GCN. Thanks for joining us today. A um, Couple of housekeeping items. Keep your mics on mute if you would, please. Um, we, we may invite you to um, follow up on a question or if we have time at the end, just unmute and ask your question to John and Nicole who are gonna present with us today. Um, but otherwise, just keep that mic on mute, um, help us limit those background noises. And if you want to turn your video on, that's great. We love to see you. Uh, it's nice to connect with people in that way in this weird, uh, weird world and setting, right? Uh, we are recording today. We will provide that um, after. You can find that on our YouTube channel, and I will send you the link to that um, in our email following up with, uh, with today's presentation. All right. Welcome, welcome. We are here today for fiduciary responsibilities for retirement plan providers. And we are so thrilled to bring you this through our partnership with Mutual of America. This is I think second or third uh, in our series with them. And um, so far all this information has just been really helpful and wonderful for our nonprofit organizations. And so we are just really excited to have back Nicole Price and John Cotty from Mutual of America. They are your local reps. And let me turn it over now to John Cotty, who is the Senior Regional uh, VP for MOA. Welcome, Hi, John. good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us on a, on a cloudy Thursday. Um, so what a better way uh, to start the day than to see uh, everyone's smiling faces. Um, we're really excited uh, to be here today, both Nicole and I. Uh, we love the partnership that we enjoy. Uh, with GCN and, and more specifically, we really enjoy these educational opportunities uh, you know, to share with you. I think growing up, I always kind of wanted to, to be a teacher. Uh, my wife's a teacher. Uh, Nicole and I do a lot of, of education. And so we take a lot of, of pride and we have a lot of passion uh, in the work that we do. Uh, if you're not familiar with Mutual of America, we were actually founded back in 1945 as a nonprofit ourselves. So uh, a lot of our guiding kind of philosophies and, and thoughts and practices uh, still flow from our, uh, you know, from our founding. I'd say today about 93% of the, the clients that we still work with are nonprofit. So uh, I'd like to, to tell folks that, that we live it, we breathe it, uh, we understand some of the challenges uh, that, that nonprofit organizations uh, go through. And so what we like to do is make sure that we're providing uh, an additional resource uh, for you as, you know, for each of your own organizations, as you see to uh, kind of build out a benefit uh, that both attracts and retains talent, 
uh, if you already have a benefit in place, uh, making sure that it's as modern as possible. Uh, one of the things that we'll kind of hit on today is that, uh, and, and Nicole, uh, I'll steal it, uh, her, her lingo, but she likes to refer to retirement plans as a living document. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've been working with Mutual of America now for uh, going on 10 years, where folks have told me, uh, oh, you know, I, the, I just kind of inherited the plan. This was set up some point in the late 80s and the late 90s. And uh, retirement plans are really funny like that in that if you constantly get the contributions going, they really are kind of set it and forget it as opposed to other benefits like health insurance and dental insurance, where it's like a trench warfare. It's a fight every year to make sure that benefits are, are covered for folks. So uh, what we want to make sure is that each of you, if you have a, an existing retirement plan, uh, just make you aware of some of the responsibilities that are associated with it. So um, if a retirement plan kind of landed in your lap, we're going to provide you with some education today to make better decisions and make more informed decisions but also allow you to put your own fingerprints on, uh, on the benefit to make sure that if the plan was set up maybe in the mid nineties and your organization has gone through some changes since then, let's uh, allow you and your team to, to kind of put your own fingerprints on the plan to make sure it reflects uh, the values of today. So as you can see here, uh, we've got the folks from um, our local Atlanta-based team one of the biggest benefits of Mutual of America and our partnership is that we're non-commissioned. So what that means is it does allow us to focus a lot on educational opportunities like this uh, with our existing clients. Um, but it's uh, you know a great a, a great opportunity to to share really important information like fiduciary responsibility. So with that said, Vin uh, no, Nicole, did you have anything that you'd like to share out the gate? No, no, I will just follow you when you are ready. I think this is, um, this is a great introduction to what we wanna talk about today. Uh, and so, as John mentioned, we're gonna go through the introduction of what fiduciary responsibility really means. And uh, certainly and specifically for plan sponsors and participants, things that perhaps, uh, as John mentioned, are not a one and done thing. It is a living document. I just really believe that that comes from my financial planning background, <laughs> that you got to revisit it. Uh, sometimes it's biannually, sometimes it's annually. It usually centers around your board meetings or committee meetings or whoever your, 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 you may have a retirement committee, whoever, whatever that fiduciary uh, party is, uh, you've got to get it reviewed. And the reason it is so important today, so, you know, uh, we want to point out these certain things simply because there's been a lot of movement in the past year with the secure, sorry, that was my little schnauzer back there. Um, <laughs> uh, last year, you know, we had a lot of um, change, of course, that is unusual, a lot of extensions where a lot of people who are in fiduciary capacity as plan sponsors didn't necessarily know what to do and what it meant to them. And so that is why we're having this session because there were some extensions, the SECURE Act, um, we got the CARES Act and there were some extensions and people didn't relatively know that um, some, some measures have been relaxed yet uh, they don't know whether or not it applies to them. So that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. All right, so going into- The, yeah, uh, the introduction, one quick thing for, for folks. Um, we want to try to keep this as, as light as possible because um, this is kind of some heavy material, um, you know, and, and it, it's hard to deliver it in a uh, in a fun and, and a, in a you know an, an uplifting fashion. But we're going to try to do so. Uh, I'm going to to share some stories of other organizations uh, and situations that they found themselves in, and some situations that we found ourselves in. So that hopefully it's relatable so that uh, each of you can kind of understand that you're not alone um, in, the, in, the, in the universe, that you're not, uh, you know, some of the challenges that you may face locally. Uh, believe me, you, like, we have seen a lot of different crazy things. So uh, we'll share some fun things along the way and, and, and some good stories. All the, all the parties will remain nameless. Um, 
But to, to start off before Nicole gets going, this whole fiduciary responsibility thing really uh, is kind of a newer thing in the retirement world. It really only became a focus in the last 10 years, um, which has kind of caught some folks that have been in leadership uh, by surprise. So that's really the, the, the real impetus behind today is to make sure that everybody understands the responsibilities behind uh, maintaining a retirement plan. And so Nicole? Yep, that sounds good. And so uh, please do not hesitate to um, enter the chat room as Emily initially requested and ask questions because if we can pick those questions up and answer them for you, we will. Uh, and we'll certainly open it up at the end of this session. We wanna make the best use of your time. And no, it's not gonna be boring because we wanna add some color around this that is uh, relatable that you're like, okay, I get it now. That's what that means. Uh, so as John mentioned, uh, the plans actually uh, are governed by ERISA, and ERISA is just an acronym for Employee Retirement Income Security Act that uh, came about in 74, as John mentioned, and that is really what governs it all. So at the end of the day, what uh, plan sponsors, and that plan sponsors, as we get into what is a fiduciary, you know, is going to involve the key leadership it's going to involve the board, perhaps if you you know if you're governed by a board. It's going to certainly involve the people, which I call frontline, which are the HR folks, your accounting folks, because they all play a part in this. So, who is a fiduciary? You can have two types. So there's the named fiduciary, uh, and every plan listed in a plan document will have. A fiduciary. You can specifically name one, and you all know who those people uh, would be. And and there's the functional fiduciary, which means it's someone who, if you're not the expert on this, but you are in a position of decision making, you can, uh, you know, they always surround themselves with the smartest or the most expert in those areas. So that's where functional fiduciaries come into play, and those people are named. And, and so also of a, a functional fiduciary is kind of a broker or an advisor who may charge you a fee for that. Correct. Yes, that's right, John. So they may, so, so you may have a uh, plan for example, as John was saying, you may have a plan that is through, um, let's say a Merrill Lynch or Wells Fargo, and then you have someone that's outside of the firm, you know, who's a broker who has to go to a yet another party to actually issue the plan. And you look at your statement and you say, why is there a different name on there? That's what that is. So that's what we consider a functional fiduciary. These are trusted individuals. And we're going to go into, you know, the named. I want to first really define what a fiduciary is. So a fiduciary is a person who or entity that actually puts your best interest and the best interests of the employees or the participants first and foremost. So that's the definition. And you can equate it to the prudent man's rule. You know, no gender specific there, I'm just saying. It is, is those who are trusted uh, to put the best interest uh, in front of any other, which again is what ERISA was developed uh, for to make sure that those um, disparities in salaries and um, payment and distributions and contributions was equal as, as possible under the law. So way real quick, Nicole, to kind of think about uh, the, the ERISA language is uh, if we go back in time, like so a lot of the, the rules and, and things that govern retirement plans all stem from the 1930s when the stock market crashed. And so Luckily, the, the government has stepped in periodically over time um, when things kind of go awry to put in some guidance and some almost some guardrails uh, to make sure that employees in retirement plans are protected. And so that's what that ERISA uh, legislation in 1974 did was it laid out some very broad uh, guidelines for how retirement plans should be operated. Uh, we're going to dig into some of those things today. But the most important thing to Nicole's point was that naming a fiduciary, that there's somebody that's in control of the retirement plan, be it uh, the CEO, uh, maybe an executive director, or actually the organization itself. But so basically somebody has to be uh, at behind the wheel, if you will, of the retirement plan. Yes. 
Yes, ma'am. Ms. Gray? Hi, I, I have a question. Okay. Be patient with me, all right? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I work for Hope Atlanta. So to my understanding, what you're saying is mutual of America, because I, I brought my thing with me so I can make sure I'm understanding what, okay. So, um, so Mutual of America Financial Group is the retirement services. So you are the one that's sponsoring this plan that I have through my organization, Hope Atlanta, for my retirement. That's right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So okay. We, are, we are super familiar with um, Jeff and Barbara and Leah. Uh, Leah, yes. Yes, and so, yeah, we love them. And uh, <laughs> actually that was one of the first plans I um, did when I joined. Uh, but I will tell you that that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. So those are the entities and you look at what Barbara does, what Jeff does as CEO, and then you have Barbara, she came in last year, you have Leah on the administrative side, those are all fiduciaries. And so to simplify it really, those are the, those are the folks on behalf of the organization who are held accountable, okay? okay? They are held accountable. And then that is why it leads us to a plan document. So it has to be documented, which again, you have to go check the document to make sure that everything is in line, okay? Because you can't have an antiquated, non-modernized, uh, one and done plan document. So, yeah. okay, one more question. Yes, ma'am. So Gregory Hibbert? Hibbert. Greg Hibbert. Hibbert. Mm -hmm. So that's my contact person. Yes, ma'am. He's one of them. Yes. Okay. Okay. So okay. Let me, you know what? You bring up a really good point, Gloria. Let me explain how our office works and looks and just very quickly go through the roles of, of who we, of, of what we do. So John is at the helm. Okay. And then there is my position along with several other people in our office uh, who help design the plan. Okay. okay, so we're the ones sitting down, uh, you know, knocking heads to say what's best based on your goals, your objectives of the organization. So, okay. you know, so that's that's my role, and there are two other gentlemen, and soon to be another, uh, who do what I do. Then from there, you have your service side. Okay. Oh, let me back up a second. We have David Arnold, who you saw on an earlier slide here. Yeah, mm -hmm. David Arnold is the gentleman and he sits also in the, in the same office uh, and he is the one who your participants and that means you too as you're enrolled in the plan. That is who helps you and assists you with your allocations, your elections and any rollovers that you may want to add assets to the plan from a former position or, or, or organization. Okay. That's what David Arnold does. So you'll see him quite a bit um, and you'll always see his name and he may call you directly. Um, and so also then we jump over to service. That's where Greg Hibbert is. He is our service manager and he has several associates working with him, Eric and Glenda. Uh, and then we also have a, a, another gentleman who has uh, recently joined us to help bridge um, both of our areas. We all sit in the same office, right in the uh, queen building of the um, King and Queen building, okay. you know, right off the perimeter. So um, I say that to emphasize. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a good opportunity to, to share like how Mutual of America set up. So in this in this situation, the, the nonprofit organization would be the named fiduciary. And then they have selected a retirement provider, right? Which is, a, we call that a fiduciary act. Like whenever you select a provider uh, to, to administer your retirement plan mm -hmm. uh, and to make investment uh, decisions, you're kind of taking on what we call a, a fiduciary act. Now, Nicole, if you can uh, select the next slide, Mutual of America in this scenario is handling um, the, uh, the, the fiduciary support. But being a fiduciary comes with the responsibilities uh, as we kind of mentioned before. So in this scenario for, for, for Ms. Gloria's organization, Mutual of America is the uh, the provider. And so we were selected and that's a fiduciary task. But Nicole, did you want to share a little bit more on what some of those uh, fiduciary responsibilities are? Exactly. Yep. So the, here, this next slide, again, it just goes back to defining what John was saying, um, of what defines a fiduciary. So it's duty of loyalty, prudence, diversity, and to have it documented. That's exactly what it is. It's basically your 
your plan. It is your plan in writing that has to be revisited because um, that, is, that is what is going to be communicated, okay? Because by law too, there has to be communication and distribution of uh, summary of description to all the participants. So that's just another uh, piece of the compliant part. And that is gonna be um, you know, held to the fire relative to the fiduciaries. So that's why this is so important. And, and you know, we the, just don't the, want- mm -hmm. The prudence is, is probably the most important because like I, I kind of mentioned earlier that retirement plans are very uh, simple in that as long as you get the contributions in on time, they tend to, or the perception is that they are, so, they're kind of easy going, a little bit of set it and forget it. You do your annual filing. If you've got a lot of employees, you have to do a plan audit. Uh, but I would say the most important thing is making sure that you get your retirement contributions, the employee contributions in on time. Uh, I have a fun scenario uh, where we showed up to a new nonprofit organization and a lady brought me one of those kind of manila uh, envelopes. And she said, here you go. And I said, well, what are these? And she goes, well, we haven't been able to get a hold of our broker for the last six months. And here are all of the employees' contributions. Can we open an account and can you place these in them? And I said, you know, ma'am, I'm so sorry, but you know, we're not even a, a provider. And she goes, that's okay. I'll sign up with you today. I just need to get this money somewhere. So things like that happen where unfortunately you may have a broker or an advisor that you had a good relationship with uh, that may have moved on. Right now, there's a lot of acquisition going on in the retirement world. There's a large provider that is kind of going around and, and buying up banks, uh, retirement plans, buying up smaller outfits, uh, and they're taking on those assets. And so sometimes your trusted point of contact for everything, uh, when they're being acquired, may not be retained. Uh, and they may have new a whole completely new setup. So uh, making sure that you have somebody uh, that you can contact is paramount um, as part of that duty of loyalty to make sure that you're doing the best for your employees. The prudent side of the house is making sure you're getting those uh, contributions in on time. Another great example is diversification. So um, part of ERISA uh, states that you have to have a broad investment selection uh, for your em employees to choose from. So we have seen some organizations in the past where they might have like four or five investments to choose from. And that may not meet the ERISA standard. Um, we've also seen in the past where some organizations might have an entire uh, fund lineup provided by one company. So uh, I've seen that commonly where you may have like company A, and we could just use a, a large company like Vanguard. They do a lot of retirement plans and individual investing. Um, let's say if you had 20 different investments, but they were all from Vanguard, you may only see Vanguard's view of the world, right? So everybody else might invest differently. So there are some risks associated with that. Um, and then lastly, that duty to follow the plan document um, making sure those contributions get in on time if you uh, have employees uh, and they have to meet a year of eligibility, making sure that they wait that time. I love to use examples. So last year we started working with uh, a new organization and uh, sometimes you run into this with the executive directors and, and the executive director said, well, I don't want to wait the year, just start withholding. That was a violation of their plan document. And, and, and so the poor, you know, HR and CFO looked at each other and said, what do we do? And they just started withholding. So we had to kind of help, you know, clean up that situation on the back end. But um, as Nicole uh, uses, uh, you know, it is a living document, meaning that you don't have to have a year of eligibility. If you want to get folks in more quickly, you can have immediate eligibility. So. Yep. Uh, but Nicole, to the to the next slide. Right before we go to the next slide, I just wanted to add too that um, you know a lot of I found clients uh, who set up these plans and then down the road they want to get comfortable with the plan. They want to see our employees going to participate. How receptive are they going to be? Uh, and they want to kind of see how things go or something changes, and they want to make a change to the plan. Uh, so this is not in the slides, it's just kind of um, 
a standby comment that you can't amend these plans. So don't think that it is, you know, oh, we want to increase the match. We want to allow automatic enrollment. We want to, you know, payroll integrate. All kind of things, that, you know, to streamline your administrative side. That is, that is a, that should be a phone call um, to have that plan amended and then just the approval of the of the board or whoever is in charge um, relative to the compliance. So, so I say that to say that's that's something that is easily fixable when you uh, we work with the team. So, yep, let's move on there. Oh, and one last tidbit I would like to add is that there's often in the in the field of plans um, a misconception that we have windows of time that you can enroll or not enroll. You know, it's equated to health enrollment, so to speak, because a lot of organizations just, you know, want to coordinate when you have a, a large number of people working at the organization and say, oh, it's health enrollment time. Let's put, you know, our plan enrollment in line with that. That eases, you know, the presentation. It's every, when everyone is gathered, but make no mistake, there is no black, there's no window of time uh that that has to be coordinated okay if that anytime these allocations for participants can be changed they can be updated so there's no time people you know sometimes do that just for the ease of, of administrating the, the plan okay so let's move on i'm going backwards so we've talked about the the fiduciary responsibility uh we've mentioned before that fiduciaries are held to a very high standard um, Nicole, actually, you can keep it right there for me. Um, actually, I need you to go back one slide. Yeah, this so how can you limit your liability? So the reality is some of these uh, fiduciary responsibility questions really were brought to, to bear when Yale University was sued. And you can think to yourself, well, that's a really big organization. What happened there? Well, Yale had a really good relationship with their broker and their advisor. Uh, and as you can know, as you might imagine, those organizations may have really long uh, relationships. Uh, and in this instance, they had had the, the same, I think, retirement plan set up for maybe 20 or 30 years. And so they always assumed that they had the best pricing. They didn't really, um, you know, do a plan review every year because they, they thought incorrectly that the organization was doing the best for their employees. The reality was that they hadn't negotiated their retirement fees in something like 10 or 20 years. So you've got a huge organization that uh, retirement plans act uh, very similarly to health insurance. So the more lives that you insure in a health insurance plan, the lower the cost is. So with a large institution like Yale that has a very large and robust retirement plan, you should be paying some of the lowest fees uh, as far as expenses go. But that wasn't the case. So some of the employees said, this is crazy. We should absolutely be paying lower. They found an attorney and then they were promptly sued. So there is some fear around some of this fiduciary responsibility language that there are some real scenarios in which uh, if the plan hasn't been looked at in 20 or 30 years, there may be some liability out there uh, to the fiduciary and to the organization. So what can you do to reduce some of that liability? Well, most importantly is, you know, kind of touching on the four things that we just mentioned, but making sure that you administer the plan to your, your provisions, to the plan document, uh, providing notices to employees on time. Uh, those are, you know, could be any kind of the annual notices. Uh, but I would say that the biggest, uh, the biggest thing is to make sure you're having an annual review meeting with your, uh, with your vendor, with your partner. Uh, to say, hey, what's going on with our investment selection? What's going on with our fees? Do we need to negotiate those things? Um, and then revisit internally. Do we have any kind of a conflict of interest here? Uh, you know, is, is anybody touching this provider in a way that may leave us exposed in the future to potential litigation? So there's some things that you can do that we'll talk on at the very end to make sure that you, you limit uh, your liability even further. Uh, but the next slide, Nicole, is uh, a section of ERISA called 404C. We've already covered this um, earlier when we stated that you just have to have a broad selection of investments. 
Uh, what's funny is uh, probably back in the 70s and 80s, most uh, companies had their CEO or executive director pick the investments for the employees, which has all kinds of liability because you've got a 25 year old that wants to be as aggressive as they want and maybe somebody that's closer to retirement that wants to be as conservative as they want. And trying to manage those investment needs for everybody can leave you absolutely exposed. Um, uh, the next slide I think is gonna take us into what are some of the requirements of a retirement plan? Um, and then some of the actions uh, that, that can come from it. Nicole, I'm looking for retirement plan requirements. You happen to know where that one is? So after this one right here, one more. There we go. Perfect. So the absolute minimum things that you'll need in a retirement plan are a written plan document. Again, we've talked about that before. That speaks to loans, uh, eligibility, when you can physically enter the plan. Uh, do you have a mutual fund or uh, some other type of contract? Making sure that you can put your hands on that contract is always a good thing. Having an investment policy statement. This is something that you'll see a lot of and a lot of uh, brokers in our industry will call uh, and try to solicit business by saying, well, if you don't have an investment policy statement, you are out of compliance and you're gonna be sued. We put a nice little note down there that says it's not technically required by ERISA. However, it is strongly encouraged. Um, we do provide investment policy statements for our clients. Um, if that's something you need help with, Nicole, myself, uh, the rest of the team, we're always available. Um, compliant record keeping, making sure that notices go out to employees um, uh, you know, as, as needed. Providing education. This is a big one because the retirement world starting in the year 2000 really kind of dumped everything on a website and said, well, if you have questions, call the 800 line. So making sure that your staff have access in some way to uh, ask someone a question, getting their questions answered. Uh, and then lastly, and this is a big one, filings with the government. Uh, I love my examples, but we have a, a, you know, a community health center in a different state uh, that uh, you know, came to us and said, hey, we need some help. And we said, okay, absolutely, what do you got? And they said, well, here are six annual filings. They're called 5500s. Here are six 5500s that we never filed. So obviously there is some cleanup that we need to do. Um, you know, oftentimes we're, we're kind of like, uh, you know, we just have to put on the, the rubber gloves and dig in and figure those things out. Luckily, the, the Department of Labor and the IRS have programs called voluntary correction programs where if you come forward and say, hey, listen, we made some mistakes, the penalties are, are far, far less than if the IRS were to discover it on their own and say, hey, we got you. How do you explain this? Uh, but the next slide, uh, Nicole. Certain information must be shared with your plan participants um, and making sure that they receive it. So uh, a couple of years back, employees uh, had to start receiving what we call fee disclosure, where they need to know what the investment fees are. Uh, what are some of the other fees associated with the retirement plan? So making sure that that is uh, delivered to your employees either electronically uh, through the website or through the mail. Uh, if you have any kind of an automatic uh, enrollment, uh, there's always a notice that goes with that. Um, and then just the summary plan description. So if you've got a newly hired person, making sure that you've got a little booklet that explains the provisions of your plans uh, to those new hires. So making sure that you uh, have somebody that you can talk to that, that can provide you with all of these is critical because you wanna make sure that uh, you don't have a, a, an employee that says, oh, I never received any of these things. I don't know what the retirement plan is. Now I'm going to see you. These are ways that you can limit your liability by providing these things. Um, just kind of a little bit of CYA, but if you <laughs> don't have help, if you don't have someone that you can contact for these things, by all means, reach out to Nicole and I uh, afterwards, and we can kind of help give some give some support in whatever capacity we can help. Uh, yep, and I just want to add very quickly too that those summary plan descriptions are supposed to, by law, be sent to the employees every five years. 
you know, and I just find with, with the turnover of leadership sometime or people moving in and out of positions, um, that gets lost in translation and it, it doesn't necessarily get done all the time. And so the new regime, if you will, has to request it. So keep that in mind with your provider as well. If you haven't seen one of those or you don't know where yours is located. Absolutely. Um, on the next slide, we're going to talk about the 5500 filing. That's your annual filing. So uh, all retirement plans, if you have a 403B or a 401k, have to make an annual filing. If you haven't made one and this sounds new, give us a call um, because we can absolutely, like I said, we've encountered all kinds of scenarios where people have said this was just not handled. To Nicole's uh, previous point, when you have transition internally and turnover, and somebody was handling all of this for you. And if you were to have someone newly to the seat and didn't know what they needed to do, and you maybe missed this filing, there's a voluntary program that we can help y'all with uh, that can easily uh, get things moving forward. The last section here is how we can, how we can help, how your current provider can help. So uh, back to understanding that fiduciary uh, responsibility and, and sometimes liability, uh, reach out to your provider. Uh, if you don't have, uh, you know, somebody that handles this stuff for you locally, if you don't have a contact, um, you know, this is where we really try to provide a lot of education and resources uh, specifically to, to GCN. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, Nicole and, and myself, uh, we're all salaried and non-commissioned. So uh, we can absolutely provide you with, uh, you know, uh, some support. If you tell us who your retirement provider is, we can kind of help you try to back into contacting them just to, you know, make sure that you're getting on the path to compliance if you're not currently in compliance. Um, your provider should be doing all of the following on the right. And so understanding what your obligations are, uh, working if you don't have one today, an investment policy statement, uh, make sure you're checking your plan demographics, right? Uh, if you've got a, a really good retirement plan, but for some reason your employees under 30 aren't accessing it, dig into that data. Why aren't they uh, accessing it? Consequently, if you've got folks that are closer to retirement and they're invested really aggressively, you might want to pull back the curtain, find out what's going on with that. Um, comparing costs with an annual benchmark fee report. This goes right back to the Yale scenario, right? They thought they had a really good plan. They had a good relationship never looked at the pricing, um, and then we're consequently sued for it. So making sure that you're, you're constantly reviewing uh, and even considering outside voices. So you may have a, a relationship with an advisor or a broker that's been in place for a, a number of years, but um, is that person doing the best? So sometimes it's nice to have just a, another um, opinion that you can place in your folder to say, hey, you know what, we did our diligence. Uh, we absolutely have a great, uh, you know, a great plan with our advisor and we researched it accordingly. Um, and then making sure you get those annual plan review meetings. That's probably the biggest uh, thing that we can stress. Uh, on the last uh, slide here, which is when you select a provider, the, the Department of Labor does make the following recommendations for you. Um, Get your information about the firm, know who they're with, uh, what the size of the organization is uh, financially, um, what kind of quality do they provide? Uh, have they just started handling retirement plans in the last 10 years? Uh, we have seen in, in our experience uh, over the last 10 to 15 years where uh, a lot of payroll providers are just stepping into the retirement space to offer an additional level of service, right? So when you're doing your diligence, look into to say like, how long have these folks been doing it? Uh, do they have a good reputation? Have they been, you know, is there a lot of litigation against them? Uh, business practices, uh, does your provider have some form of liability insurance? Uh, how do the, P, uh, the fees compare with others in the industry? Uh, what do their investment selections look like? Um, those are some good things that when you're, maybe if you're considering adding a retirement plan uh, for the first time, this is a great slide to print out um, to, to offer you some guidance as you're selecting. And on this book, we actually had one more slide. Um, and this just kind of goes back to that fiduciary side of the house on that responsibility. So 
Um, every provider uh, has their own approach to protection. So we actually had a question uh, in the in the comment box of of asking, is it uh, is it normal uh, to have a, a functional fiduciary advising employees as opposed to leaving it up to the officers? And so really it depends on, um, you know, your level of comfort. So uh, in this scenario, maybe an organization has selected a fiduciary to, to go out to the universe and say, I want you to pick our investment lineup. I want you to uh, kind of, you know, be that, be that, that resource for us. Um, that's the scenario in which, you know, uh, you, you do have somebody that's compensated for those things. Um, the, the, the way the industry uh, presents itself is sometimes that these are, uh, you will wipe your hands of, of responsibility and liability in that scenario. Uh, there are levels of protection that are available out there, but never forget that even selecting a fiduciary or selecting an advisor is a fiduciary act. So there's never a, a way to 100% wipe your hands completely of fiduciary liability or responsibility. Um, Mutual of America, the way that we handle this is that we offer an indemnification. So basically our investment management team in New York, we have $27 billion in assets under management they go out to the universe and they've selected 50 different investments for our clients to choose from. Uh, the investment management team meets with the individual fund managers four times a year uh, as part of our, diligence, our due diligence. And then we present that information to our clients annually to share with them, these are the funds that we're monitoring and possibly looking at replacing. And we give, the, we get, we give you a, an indemnification to say that if anybody were to ever sue you, we would absolutely pick up those court and legal fees associated with that suit. So there's really two different ways of, of, of kind of managing and, and mitigating that fiduciary responsibility. We handle it through an indemnification. Um, other groups will, you know, can provide you with uh, fiduciary services to, to take care of those uh, actions. So to the question in the, in the comment board or the chat room, um, yeah, it absolutely is normal to have a, a fiduciary uh, advise employees. And so I think that's really it. So there's a lot, it's a lot to kind of squeeze into 45 minutes. And I think we were trying to do it in 42. Uh, so um, by all means, do we have any questions? Because we kind of have covered a lot. Well, um, I, I, I just want to thank you all because I have been receiving the mail and the, I mean, information in the mail about my plan and everything. And I was like, I'm not getting any of this. And so I was going to contact someone. And when I seen this pop up on a nonprofit university, I was like, this is what I need. This is what I need. So I'm just, it's, just a, it's a God given to me that you all provided this today. Cause it gave me some enlightenment and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I can tell you, uh, I want to thank, you know, everyone at, at Georgia Center for Nonprofit because, uh, you know, from Kathy to certainly Emily over there um, and Reggie Say, who uh, chairs membership over there, they've worked with us and we've, this is, this is probably, I think our fourth year of really being strong partners and trying to understand what Georgia Center for Nonprofit members are seeking. So we are really honored to have the opportunity to be a part of such an educational series and, and timely information. And then, so as we wrap this up, I want to encourage everyone who's on the call and uh, we'll follow up with those who registered and perhaps didn't get to join this morning, uh, the importance of the plan review, okay? We can't drive that home any any stronger. You know, we just can't any more strongly than we have. Um, secondly, uh, you do, whether we like it or not, change is something we have to embrace. So I would encourage everyone who has a plan or is thinking of a plan to look to modernize their plan. And that takes, again, review uh, and make sure that uh, it is compliant. If not, it is fixable. Take some time, but you know, don't, don't um, 
that's why we're here. That's why all your providers should be here. We're here to lend support there and help you figure it out and to move on from that. So um, we've, and we've got a question. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, we've just got a question coming in about the slides. Will they be available um, to, to serve as a checklist to uh, be able to follow up on, on an organization's plan? And the answer, of course, is yes. So we will send those out to those who registered and participated today. Um, mm -hmm. But if someone's catching this on the replay, there uh, should be a link at the bottom of the replay and you can catch uh, the slides there as well. Perfect. And then yeah. question, yeah. Uh, sure. another question for you. Um, so what if, what if you are, and this happens a lot in nonprofits, right? There's turnover, um, especially COVID people being out of the office. What if you don't even have a starting point, right? What if you, you know that there's a plan, um, you signed up for it a few years ago, you're now the one in charge. You don't really have your documents. You don't know where to start. What is that first step that people take? Uh, I would say reach out to if you don't. So if you're brand new, right, or or in this scenario where uh, if you don't have any resources, right, because I can't tell you how many uh, clients that that we have that that came to us because they said I just didn't have anybody to contact. Uh, because unfortunately, with turnover in the retirement world, with like I mentioned before, there's acquisitions, there's folks that move, uh, folks that retire out, and then you know. Commonly, if your if your if your point of contact retires, they may just throw you in with somebody in a geographical region that you may have never heard of, and it's hard to get a hold of them. I would say, uh, Emily, in that in that scenario, just reach out to Nicole or, or myself because um, if you if you've been filing your annual fifty five hundreds or if you haven't, uh, usually that's kind of one place where you can look. Uh, but we can hop on phone calls with you uh, just to say like, hey, listen, you know, if it's company A and we contact them and we might have to start with the 800 line to say, hey, listen, we have a retirement plan. Um, I think this is what the number is. Can you help us locate somebody uh, locally or some, if you have somebody that we can talk to? And, you know, ultimately you may have to go through the phone tree and all of that. And it may take some time, but I would say that, that Nicole and myself or Andrew or, or really anyone uh, reaching out to us, we can at least point you in the right direction. Yep. Um, let me add to that real quick, John, is that uh, because we will get, like John mentioned, we will get on the phone and we will dial with you because one, we know the process. Two, we know the jargon that is used that can sometimes misguide people. Uh, and then to uh, Gloria's point, the, you know, you mentioned that you did not get any statements. You're going, you know, what is what, what is what? The thing is a lot of these plans and a lot of uh, the change and modernization I was talking about is that they're streamlining a lot of the administrative processes. So a lot of the communications are now coming over um, in an e-document style. And so you're not gonna always get something in your mailbox unless you request that. So those are just kind of some little ins and outs that may say, wait a minute, I haven't seen a statement in three months. You know, those are things we can also help you check. So one thing I wanna pose while we wait uh, and hold here for a couple more questions. So if you have any, you know, put them in the chat, let us know um, and we'll work through those. And of course, if you have direct questions about your specific um, plan, please, please, please follow up with uh, Nicole, Andrew or John, um, I, I think, I definitely have, have felt through this and I hope you have too, that um, they are absolutely open to, to talking through whatever those particulars are for your plan um, and help you in any way that they can. Um, but I also know that we have, we have more coming from MOA. And so while we have this group on the phone, what's the next step? What, what do you need? What information are you looking for? Um, what topics do you want our experts at MOA to cover for you? Um, drop that in the chat or you can send it um, to me at GCN, info at gcn.org, um, because we're, we're planning our next one already. I think we're shooting for March. So uh, we want to hear from you. Y'all are here on the call. You're obviously in, uh, invested in those services for your organization. So let us know. And we have programs available for, for individuals, um, kind of a retirement 101. Uh, you know, how do you invest in your 20s, 30s, 40s? Um, we've got Social Security 101. Uh, plan Administrator 101, that's probably one of our most common ones and most popular ones where, 
It, it helps folks that are new to the seat that uh, have never you know, administered a retirement plan before uh, to say, how do I get these contributions in? How do I process a loan? Um, you know, a, a conversation we had last week with a, a nonprofit uh, in Northern Georgia was, um, you know, I became the CEO a year ago and we have a retirement plan and it's administered nationally. Um, but I've, I feel like I've, you know, I've, I've sent them my contact information eight times and for whatever reason, they're still sending it to the old CEO's email address. What do I do in that scenario? And so we, we literally just had to hop on the phone with them and actually walk them through, okay, you have it, but send us a sample email. Um, and so like the nice thing is I can, I can share with you now, you know, being with Mutual of America for almost 10 years is we were, we're not being commissioned is a very liberating thing for us because we can actually do good in our community. We don't have to kind of treat everything like a, like a car sale where like, well, if you leave the lot today, you know, and it's, and, you know, beating on the hood and all that stuff, it's, you know, we, we like to think of ourselves that we live in a very exclusive neighborhood in the retirement community where we actually care about the folks that we, that we work with and, and we care about providing uh, resources. Um, but we had a question come through and, and how can you review the plan to be sure that you have the best for your organization? Um, that's a great that could question. could be our next think, topic. <laughs> uh, there you go. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you conduct a plan? Um, we can absolutely cover that. Uh, the, the, short, uh, the short version of that uh, for, for Maria, uh, I would say is uh, scoot back a couple slides um, when you have the opportunity to uh, and look at, uh, look at your, you know, try to locate your plan document and, and go through things like eligibility uh, entry dates. Uh, we've had a scenario, and I can't tell you how many times it's come up, where folks, uh, when they set up their retirement plan back in the, the early 90s, there was a cost associated with every employee that was in the plan. So in order to kind of limit some of those fees, they would put in a, a one-year eligibility, and then you could only enter the plan on January or July 1st. So we call it losing the retirement lottery. If you get hired on February 1st, you would have to wait as much as 17 months before your first dollar goes into the retirement plan. That is kind of a red flag to say, okay, we need some help. We need to, to, to look at something. Uh, I do wanna take a quick moment to, to remind folks, if you're not aware of the benefit that you receive through GCN, uh, Mutual of America, we actually waive our administrative fees uh, for, uh, for active members of GCN. Um, so uh, if you don't know how much you're paying, or if you've got a quarterly payment that's going out every couple months or an annual payment to somebody, um, and now we're in a brand new year and everybody's kind of looking at finances. If you're looking at a way to kind of reduce some of your expenses, uh, Nicole would be glad to, to take a look at that and show you what, what that fee waiver might mean for your organization. So yep. for, for Maria, I would say pull up maybe your summary plan description uh, to go through some of those things and say, okay, functionally as our plan works, you know, do these things make sense? Is there an easier way to do them? Uh, because your plan document, some of it is governed by the IRS, but a lot of it really should be customized by your organization. And then on the investing side of the house, uh, if you ask your employees today, well, are you happy with the retirement plan? The vast majority would say yes, because the stock market's been up for the last 10 years. So if you've been in the, in the market for 10 years, everybody's really done well. But we like to kind of ask a, a, a deeper question to say, you know, do you feel like you're getting the education and the access that you need? Uh, are you happy, uh, you know, with your understanding of the plan? And so those are some questions that you may be able to ask. And Maria, to your uh, question in the chat room on um, is your plan document available electronically? That's going to be based on your provider currently. Uh, and so you, you've got to, it, it depends, you know, on whether you all have those services available. Most do have a website and it will have um, a, a hyperlink to the actual plan description that'll give you the details about your, your specific plan. 
Um, yeah, usually there's some kind of like an admin website where you log in and, and usually you can find it um, on the, the website where you upload your contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, but if not, um, I would absolutely reach out to, to your provider um, and you may be able to access it just by uh, logging into your own personal account and you might be able to find uh, contact information there. Oh, perfect. Uh, Maria, we'll follow up with you afterwards. Oh, okay. Got Yeah. And another thing um, for those of you who like, like, you know, maybe just took a new seat and you don't know what the filing status is, you can always go to the IRS site um, on eFAST and uh, do a filing search for your organization. And it will show you the last filing that the IRS has um, on your 5,500, whether, um, whether it is a um, standard form or short form. All right, and with that, I don't see any more questions coming in and we are right at our time. So thank you so much, Nicole and John. This was um, a great overview and lots, lots of to-do lists, right? That you've, that you've created for us. <laughs> yeah, um, no, but we appreciate it. We love it. Yeah, we could talk about this all day. At least John knows I can. He won't let me though. But, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, Shut up. but, uh, but anyway, thank you all very much for taking time out of your morning uh, on, on a, a very uh, busy past two weeks and, and, and strenuous two weeks. So we appreciate the presence and please know that we're here. Uh, and call on us because we'll, we'll, we'll definitely help you uh, from where, wherever you are now to where you want to go. That sounds like a plan. Thank you, Mutual right. America, Nicole and John. Everyone have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.